Well, thank you this morning. Thank you for your grace in our lives, God. Thank you for this church. Thank you that we have life in the body. Your presence. Your grace. Your promises, Father. and you man I'm just thankful for all that you've blessed us with for all that you've led us in different places the things that happen God the things that did not happen your moments of protection provision Lord thank you thank you that you are faithful Our eyes fixed on your power. Let's continue to look unto you, Jesus. Worship you this morning in our hearts, Father. Give you all the praise. Give you this time this year ahead into your hands, Father. Lead us and guide us by your Spirit. Give us listening ears, Lord. Give us open hearts, Father. Thank you. Pray for our pastor this morning. For his life. His ministry, his love and care. And many prayers that he prays for the body. We thank you. Bible school semester begins and uh, I was thinking of this theme of uh, preparation and uh, also <clears throat> what uh, something that Pastor Shibari said was, so was just like, well, read this, he said, your life is a foundation on the Bible, your fellowship is with the Bible, your faith is in the Bible, and the fruit of your life is the life of God manifested in you. You know, I was thinking about this part and how, how our life is uh, every day, what we do, the decisions we make, the time that we spend, the things we say has an effect. And uh, you know, it's the whole life, the whole Christian life is a preparation to stand before Jesus someday. It's the Venus seat. Uh, everything that we do, <clears throat> everything that we say, every action is a preparation. Some, it's, it's, it has an effect. It's not in vain. It's not in waste. It's uh, it's not just forgotten. It's not just just goes by, and you know we we forget about it. And it may not remain in our memory, but uh, life itself, every day we live is a preparation to stand before Jesus one day, and uh, that's the day that a Christian uh, finally gets his reward. That's the day the Christian finally sees the value of everything they did on this earth. That's the day when. When we are face to face with Jesus Christ, is that's the reality. That's the day we look forward to, uh, because that's when we see, you know, all all the things, all the things that are in our mind, all the all the unfulfilled desires, or why this did not happen, or why this happened, and when we did something and no one recognized, and no one saw, and no one appreciated, and or all we did and nothing happened, we will see the result. We will see the fruit of it uh, at the beamer seat. Life is a preparation for that, and uh, you know we, we don't want to live uh, looking for results right now. Uh, we, would, we want to be occupied with eternal, the things that are eternal, the things that matter to God. And, uh, I was studying for the class, and I was thinking about uh, the people in the Bible and the scriptures, the characters that we see, and uh, how how what they said, how what they made the statements has, has eternal consequences and, and the first I was thinking of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, 46 and 47 and this is Moses speaking and he's saying to the people, set your hearts on all the words which I testify among you today, which you will 
command to your children to be careful to observe all the words of this law. For it is not a futile thing for you, because it's your life. And by this word you will prolong your days in the land which you cross over to the Jordan to possess. You know, what do you think of, uh, what comes first to your mind when you think of Moses? You know, the first things that come to our mind sometimes is, uh, you know, the, the Red Sea. You know, the ten plagues that happened in his encounter with Pharaoh and, uh, you know, leading them into the wilderness and, you know, how the burning bush and and standing before the burning bush and all those things. But it's interesting that at, when it comes to Deuteronomy 32, when he's, when he's giving his final remarks, he doesn't mention any of those things. He doesn't mention the burning bush. He doesn't mention those. He, he's, not, he's not talking about those things. And as we read, we, we know that, that Moses' life many times is you know, broken into three parts. First 40, 40, and 40. The first 40 years he thought he was somebody the next 40, he realized he's a nobody. The last 40, he realized what God can do with a nobody. And many times when we read the scriptures, we are occupied with the first 40 years where we see what he was, the education, the bull rushes, and he's picked up by the Pharaoh's daughter, and, and all those things, and then we are focused on the other part. But, but the real life of Moses was lived in the second part of 40 years behind the desert, where you have just one verse speaking about it. And that's what Moses brings out in, in Deuteronomy 32. He's not talking about all the achievements that he had. He's not talking about the things that he has done. But in his heart, he's, he's communicating to Joshua. What, what really matters is those times when no one spoke about it. It's behind in the desert place where he was being prepared. He's communicating that. He's saying, you know what? It's not a futile thing. For us, many times we may think 40 years wasted behind the desert, but I think he's referring to that period saying it was not a futile thing. If you live seeking God and if your life is prepared looking and searching for Him, uh, it's, not, it's not vain. It's that, that is the time that you need in your life. And, uh, you know, we, I don't know if you've heard this message, but you should. It's uh, by Dr. Stevens called uh, Digging Ditches in the Classroom when he speaks about preparation in life of Bible school is like it's in the stories from 2 Kings chapter 3 when the enemy is attacking and God says go and dig ditches and they say but we don't see the clouds, we don't see the water, how will, how will we win? And he says no, your job is just dig the ditches. The water will come, the rain will come, but you prepare, you, your life is a preparation. You go ahead and dig the ditches. And see that, you know, when we think about that like <clears throat> what would Moses say at the end? It's like, this book is my life. That's what he's saying, basically. He talks about, this book is my life. The words in this book are my life. And he says, be careful to observe them. Be careful. By this word, you will prolong your days in the land. You know, and... Uh, we, we, we all prepare, right? Uh, before getting your driving license, there is a training school, hopefully. Uh, before exams, there is preparation. More for the parents, less for the kids, sometimes. Uh, before cooking, before marriage. Before all those things in life, there is a preparation, there is a time that is spent in preparing for it. And then it happens. And so it is with the Christian life as well. There is a time of preparation, there is a time between you and God, and I think that time is Bible school time. And we, sometimes you can say, you know, we, we come into Bible school tired after a long day's work. And, but you, you leave refreshed. I can be exhausted coming to Bible school, but I can go out refreshed because the Word is my life. It's because this Word is not futile. It's because what the training that I'm going through right now is God is preparing me for the days ahead. And Moses thinks about it. Moses talks about it. And he says, this is what life is. And as man, we can focus on the two other periods, but when Moses brings you back to the main thing, he brings you back to that aspect of life, and he says, no, this is the price, this is the place. This is the most valuable time. The time of being in classes, the time of being under the word, the time of being... I mean, is it prayer like that sometimes? Like we pray, but we don't see the results so many times, and we are wondering, is it going to make a difference? And is something going to happen really? But that doesn't mean we stop prayer. 
because we are not seeing the results. But there is, it's a preparation. The life of prayer is like a preparation also. We are being prepared. Our heart has been prepared that we keep seeking God, we keep asking Him. And, and, and there is a time when the results will come. There is a time when things happen, when things change. And, and, and I, was, I was thinking of this like, uh, we would, we would uh, many of us, and a lot of them are serving on the fields today. <coughs> Post work at 6 o'clock, come back and go to class. And that time we had a different system of Bible school, we had one class every hour. So we had four classes on the same day, 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock. And it would be fun because, you know, we would go from 6 to 7, 7 to 8, 8 to 9, and run and out and get a cup of tea and you know, do all those things. But but by 10 o'clock, we were, we were more happier and more joyful and there was more strength than we were at 6 o'clock. And I don't know how that happens. It's God who does those things. It's the Holy Spirit that ministers and there is something said in each class and there is something said and, and I take it in my heart and I think about it the whole night. I'm thinking about it the next morning and I'm saying, God, how do I apply this in my life? How do I, how, how, do, how will this change me? How will this help me touch someone else's life? I don't know those things. But God knows. God says, you be faithful where you are and the remaining part I will do. And that's like, that's like a life of preparation. And then the second thing I was thinking was, <coughs> and this is uh, 1 Chronicles 28, 9. And it's the same thing that we think about. Um, David is saying to his son. And he's talking about it and he says, as for you, my son, Solomon. Like, what do we think about David's life? His early life, we think about the time he was a shepherd. The time of Goliath, the time of the bear and the lion. In his later life, we think about the ark. We think about plans for the tabernacle, the temple, uh, the many victories that he had. But where is the real life that came up? It came up in the cave of Adul. It came up in front. And I like what Pastor Shibali said. He said, that means it's a place of God's joy. He was on the run, but it was in a place of God's joy. There he was alone with God. You know, we, we read his mighty exploits that he did, we read his psalms, we think about all that he has said, we think about the man after God's own heart. But where did that man after God's own heart dwell up? Yes, there was a beginning in the backside of a in, in, again in the desert with the sheep. But where did that really dwell up? It dwell up in that cave at Adila. It's that place where the joy was found. It's that, that's the place where David's life was prepared for what God wanted him to do. And why is he the greatest king? Why is he known as the greatest king that Israel ever had? It's because of the time that he had with God. And that's, that's our lives. Like many times we do things and we may not see the result. But God says, by faith, keep going on. By faith, keep moving on. By faith, continue to pray. By faith, continue to go out soul winning. By faith, continue to have a mission trip. By faith, go on and be in Bible school. By faith, keep coming to church services. By faith, do those things. And when I may not see the results and I may get occupied with my four walls in my home or in my office. And I can have a chair in the office where I'm stuck to all my day. But then there is a greater purpose. Because life is a preparation that we will see Christ one day. And there is the grace of God. God gives us the grace in those moments. Where we say, God, we, we want to know. We want, we want you, but we don't have it. The desire is lacking. I'm not motivated enough. And ask God. And by the grace of God, He gives that to you. Because it's valuable, it's important. We place a, we place a priority, a value on that life. You know? and, uh, many times we can, we can think of comfort. We can think of the easiest things to do. We can think of escapes. You know, what is most convenient. But I like what Pastor said on 31st night. Go out and get, take some risks. Go out, go out and take some risks. Do something that you normally wouldn't do. Go out and take some risks for the Lord. And do, do some things that you would normally not take a step to do it. And then watch God in action. Then watch how God comes into pain. Then watch God how God makes you come through. And that's exciting. That's the adventure of the Christian life. Is to take those steps, bold steps of faith when it doesn't make any sense. Did it make any sense for the woman in 2 Kings chapter 4 to go and borrow empty vessels when she had so much oil? Like this much oil? 
Did it make any sense for her to go and borrow those vessels and say, because one day, this is all the barrels, the tanks, everything is going to be full because the man of God has said, so let me go out and get those vessels. Like, let me get the teacup, let me get the, you know, the utensils, let me get the drums, let me get everything because till the vessels are there, the oil is going to flow. And then, then they, they pour the oil and the oil flows. And how can so much oil come from so little? How can so much oil come from so little? This, this a little bit was there. That's God. How can so much happen from so little? That's the work of God. God knows how to do those things. We don't have to figure them out. We have to just have that faith to say, if God is saying from here the oil will come and it will fill those vessels, then it will. If God is going to say those things, if God is saying, yeah, this is what my plan for you is, and I don't understand it, but I'm going to take that step. You know why? Because God says it. How can so much oil come out of a little bit? But our job, what was the work? Go get the vessels. And if there is, if not, it is finished in your house, go borrow them. Go borrow them. So much of life is like that. Like I was thinking about uh, Abhiram and I was thinking about Pastor Abhi, the many other men. And uh, the years they were in Bible school in the church office, and, you know, seemingly nothing was happening. Seemingly, they were just doing the routine up and down, going to the bank, going to uh, drop some paper here, going to the courier office, going doing this, doing that, all those things. But quietly behind, in those few hours that they would get in the evening, was Bible school going on. And God was like saying something in the heart. God was like knocking and knocking, and something was going on in those places. Can that happen today? Of course it can. It will. The man and the woman would decide in their hearts that this is what God wants for their life and they, they put their trust in Christ Jesus. That's what's going to happen. When we take those steps of faith and when it doesn't make any sense, that is still going to happen. Who would have imagined, like personally, when I go to Lucknow, I'm amazed at what happens. Who would have ever imagined that that's what Pastor Abhinav will be doing, like five years, ten years from now. And when it was in the office, it didn't seem like that. It just seemed that this man has got something on his heart and he wants to serve the Lord. That's it. That's, that's all we could see. But then God did something. And if you ask him, how did this happen? He says, God knows. I'm just being there. What, I'm just doing what God has called me to do. That's it. How does God add to our lives? How does God multiply things in our life? How does God take us from this level to this level in our life? It's a mystery. And that mystery is faith. It's that life of preparation that we have before the Lord and we say, God, here I am. I want to be. I want to serve you. I want to seek you. I want you in every aspect of my life. But I'm unable to. I can't sometimes. Life is tough. My family doesn't understand. My friends' opinions are difficult. They make fun of me sometimes. That's all okay. God, I've tried following you once and it did not work out. I tried doing this so many things for you, but it didn't work out and I failed. Go back to the message on 31st and you know what? There is enough room for failure. There is enough room for grace for any failure that happens in the life. Like Samson failed, but the hair came back on his head. Samson failed, but the hair came back. That's the grace of God. So what if things have failed? So what if things did not work out? So what if nothing changed? Maybe this is the time. Maybe that was preparation and maybe this is now the time where God really wants and He will show you what He can do. Who knows? Maybe this is it. But we live like that. We want, we want to think like that. And 2 Timothy chapter 4. And these last words that Paul is speaking to Timothy. And again, what do you think of Paul when you think about it? His first part of his life, what do you think? Pharisee, Jew, zealous, persecuting Christians. What do you think of the end of his life? The apostle, the missionary, the amazing church planter the writer of almost half of the New Testament, all those things. But we miss out one verse. Three years in Arabia with the Lord. Is that one line? Three years in Arabia with the Lord. 
How could such a radical transformation take place? It was three years in Arabia with the Lord learning the word. That's where the transformation took place. You know, uh, I think it was past uh, Brother Rajkumar who said something, I don't know if it was, or someone else, he said, uh, don't, don't be a strawberry Christian. And I'm like, what do you mean don't be a strawberry Christian? He says, don't be a strawberry Christian in soul winning, in Bible school and in church. Strawberry. He says, yeah, you see them once and then you don't see them the whole year. He says, don't be that. And I was like, hmm, hmm. Like, what we start, we finish. And I like what Paul is saying to Timothy. There's a great things that, a lot of good things that he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4. But I like verse 13. He says, when you come, bring back my books. Bring back the word, bring back the parchments, the things that been, they have been written. <clears throat> like, that's just life, like I think about it. Bring them back. And uh, what, what has God planned for us this year? I don't know. <clears throat> but will those things be amazing that he will do? Yes. Will those things be uh, a little bit radical? Will those things enable us to grow, to draw closer to him? seek him out even more to have a purpose, to have a plan, uh, to do even greater things that God will do in the years. Of course he will. And I'm not talking of in a way like only you can look at the missionaries and do that. But what I'm talking about is my personal, your individual, personal own life. Your life as an individual, your life as a family, your life as a church. All those things. It's not just restricted to just the mission field out there. But it's restricted not anywhere. It's, it's in a way there is no walls. There is no barriers to what God can do. And first it will be always our life and then it's in our families and then it goes out. And I like because Moses began by saying the book and Paul is saying bring back the book. And that's kind of a hint. Like bring that thing. Moses says keep your, keep your mind, the first writer is saying keep your mind on the word. And Paul is saying no matter what happens in the end, bring those books, I love that. I'm going back to those things. And in all these three lives, it's the time of the preparation that is least spoken about. But it's the time that they were alone, the time that they were with God, that brought the maximum results also. And many times from the outside, we can think that we may not see the results as they are. You know, I was, there's a song that the music team sings and it says, so much of the story is still to unfold. Right? I think I song sang that some a week or two back. There's a glorious unfolding. Hold on to the promises and you will be amazed. Just watch and see and keep on believing, something like that, right? It's the glorious unfolding of God's plan. When we are in Bible school, it's the glorious unfolding of God's plan. When you're in church services, it's the glorious unfolding of God's plan in our lives. And this this, this, this thought I'd want to say, you know, like, everyone, Every one of us has a purpose. Every one of us has a plan. Every one of us has an eternal purpose. Every one of us has a greater measure of grace of God upon our lives to accomplish what God wants us to be accomplished in our lives. And we don't live this life for 20, 30, 40 years and waiting to see what will happen. But we are waiting that one day we face Christ. One day this life that we lived, every decision that we made, every word that was spoken, every action that was taken, every effect that had, had an effect. And it's a preparation that we stand before the Lord one day. Amen. I'm going to ask you something. Have you come to church with an expectation? Have you expectation? God is going to speak tonight. Okay. When the, when the lame man at the beautiful gate sat there, he saw Peter and John. He said he looked at them expecting to receive something. Expectation from God precedes manifestation. So again, expectation precedes manifestation. 
There's times when we come to church, we expect, expect God to speak, expect a promise, expect a lima, expect the supernatural, expect an encounter. Don't just come, sit in church, but come with expectation. Amen. Amen. Pastor Thor said, we all spoke, they dug ditches. Why? Come and say it. Expectation. When Moses turned burning bush, let's just see what God is doing. Expectation. In one moment, his life was transformed. Elijah went, sent the servant, said, Brain is coming. What do you expect? Expectation. If you come to church, have no expectation. God's in move this moment, this hour, you finish. What you expect can't work if you have no expectation. Amen. How many have the expectation? Very chance. How many want to come to church at ten fifteen? I love you. <laughs> Bless you. Most of them all. Right? Okay. I have a young, wonderful young man. I love the way he sings the song. Nobody don't know kids do solos. Please accept him. Love the young man. Welcome, Daniel. Daniel. I'm Angie, aunties, and Uncle Justin's nephew. The name of the song is The End of the Beginning and thank you Best Carl and Auntie Sue for this opportunity. I was taking a trip on a plane the other day just wishing that I could get out when the man next to me saw the book in my hand and I knew nothing what it was about. So I settled back in my seat, the best said I said History and mystery in one. Then I opened the book and began to read from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was born of a virgin one holy night in a little town of Bethlehem. Angels get around him underneath the stars, singing praises to the great I am. He walked on the water, he healed the lame, and made the blind to see again. And for the first time, he walked up. We learned that God could be a friend And though he never ever did a single thing wrong But the angry crowd chose him And then he walked on the road and died on the cross And that was the end of the beginning That's not in your book, it's a Bible, he said And I've heard it all before I've tried religion, it's shame and guilt And I don't need it anymore It's superstition made of tales just to help the weak to survive i said i'll read it again but listen closely this is gonna change your life he was born of a virgin one holy night in the little town of bethlehem angels get around him underneath the stars singing praises to the great i am he walked on the water he healed the lane and made the blind see again and for the first time they all right we learned that God could be a friend And though he never ever did a single thing wrong But the angry crowd chose him And then he walked on the road and died on the cross And that was the end of the beginning The end of the beginning he said with a smile What more there could be, he's dead You said they hung him and put nails on his hands and the crown of thorns on his head. I said I'll read it again, but this time there's more, and I believe that this is true. His death wasn't the end, but the beginning of life, which is completed in you. Don't you see, he did all this for you. He was born of a virgin one holy night in the little town of Bethlehem. Angels singing praises to the great I am. He walk on the water, he in the lane, made the blind to see. And for the first.
first time you honored, we learned that God could be a friend. And though he never ever did a single thing wrong, but the angry crowd chose him. And then he walked, and he died, but three days later. Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. For a light affliction which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for the eternal things in our life, God. And we pray that as we hear the message, and we listen to your word, God, give us those eyes to see the things that are eternal. Lord, fix our heart on those things, Lord. And just pray for Pastor as he ministers to us. Empower him, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. See me life through God's eyes. As God sees life on the earth. That's the title of my message. How we see life determines how we live it. How we view life on earth determines how you view it, live it. How you plan your purpose for living, goals, your friendships, how you spend your time. <coughs> That's why God wants us to learn the Word of God, Bible. Because when we learn the Bible, we suddenly see the world through what? God's eyes. Amen? Before I came to Bible College, I had my own different plans. Different, completely different. Once I began reading the Bible and learned the Bible, the whole plans changed. I wonder why. God did it. We should a dying them. Okay. We like to use them Bible college in the name of public peace. Oh, it's clear. It's clear. There you go, okay. How do you see the world? History, science, religion, society. How should we see the world? One day is to see the world through our own eyes. So people don't lost to they see the world through own eyes. And they come up with nonsense. We see we see the world through the lens of God's word. Let me tell you this. How do you understand history? How can a man understand history? I said, oh, I understand history. I hear what Adam and Eve, Abel and Cain, Noah, 
Tsar Babel, Abraham, Jewish nation, Gentile nations. Actually, history different. Actually, history going forward in a plan, God's plan, ending in the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus, the new heavens, new earth. Changes my view of life. How do you see religion? We will say, okay, all religion is just a war. From where? From the child Babel. So, looking at the Bible, I can determine and understand everything about life. Science. What purpose we spent to you? Okay. Think of astronomy and space exploration, kind of that. Look at that, one moment. Look at that. That's, that's I think that's hopefully got it right. Let's assume that's planet Earth from space. Okay, imagine that. A little planet called Earth, where there's six, seven billion people. Why? Where you come from? Chinese, Americans, Africans, all walking along the Earth, looking quite busy. Suitcases, cell phones, jets, all fields, works. What are we doing? Where did we come from? We know where we came from. Right? God created heavens and earth. But the, the world of people around us, turn the television on, see Discovery Channel. People are spending billions of dollars, billions of dollars, looking for a life on Mars. Crazy. Talk to the Bible, read the Bible, you save lots of money. I was watching a program yesterday where they show news, the CNN show news of how excited scientists were because they put a lander, a probe on a comet, thing to reach heaven. They put a probe landed probe on a comet, you know that. And the people in the space room, excited, jumping, tears in eyes, why? I landed a probe on a comet. Big deal. What's the meaning? What if we put a robe on Mars? What if we put a, a space landing on Mars? What do you find? Nothing. I tell you what, nothing. I find tonight, this morning, science with God is crazy. I tell you what, there's no big bang, it's only a big being. The big God created heaven and earth. Amen? So, I read the Bible, and Psalm 119 says, Verse 97 says, says, I have learned wisdom and I have more wisdom than my enemies. So the next verse says, I learned your commandments. I have more insight than my teachers. I also have more wisdom than the aged. So someone learning <coughs> God's word has more wisdom and people all around the world. That's what happens in the Bible. Now listen, why if you we learn the Bible? When we learn the Bible, we have God's mind. We see life as God sees it. Because we don't see it as God sees what God says. Man sees differently. 
we all see it differently. So we need to learn God's word so we can have his mind, so we can see life differently. We need to move that into four different areas. Number one, we want to see your potential as God sees your potential. Number two, we want to see your failures as God sees your failures. Number three, want to see your talents as God sees your talents. And number four, I wanted to, this morning to see time as God sees it in light of eternity. I start with this one. Seeing as God sees your potential. Mother David, Mother David, before Goliath, pre Goliath days, David was nobody. When people saw David, he was a teenager. Loved outdoors, home, music, house. And then one day, when only God saw David, he saw a man with heart after him. And Kit, God saw in David a future king. God said, one day David will be my honor, and Jesus will be called the son of David. Uh, the story, my story there, the summer, special brother in ballroom, yeah, and God goes in special buddy. There's a man with a ponytail, happy days, in ballroom. And as far as people are concerned, he's a 24 year old man with no purpose. And God comes to him, taps on his shoulders, says, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He said, Are you crazy? Get out of here. No, Jesus loves you. I told him, Get out. No. God sent me to tell you, He loves you. Took her to our tomorrow. Remember that? For two years, gonna forget what happened. And the same man becomes a missionary to Africa. 200 churches, Bible schools, orphans, his body leader. Why? God saw potential. Because God sees people. Uh, man sees people. God sees you all the time. If you're an young person alone, God sees potential in you. It says, I want to use you. You don't know me now, but you will know me. One day I'll use you more if you only get to know me. How many know Pastor Monty has a similar story? He was 15 years old in a small town in Finland. He was going down in the evening to a dance hall, dancing, fence. And the young girl, the market sweat, was had a big poster inviting people to this meeting. And very timidly, she stepped up, gave him a flag. He said, as she gave me his flag, her hands were shivering, trembling. Insecure girl, timid girl, but she had enough guts, gave him a flag. Are you following the thing? Are you following what I'm saying? 
Do I need an echo? Okay, good. Oh, look what happened. One young man, he said that evening that the flag decided no one go dancing. So I didn't go to church today, but I didn't go dancing either. I went home to see the song. He was right there, giving life to Jesus. When I went to art school, art school, he learned to be an artist. But after some time, decided it's not good enough. What do I do? Someone say, go to Bible school. Went to Bible school. Man of God. After Bible school, he said, I put my art down. He said, the art I learned was many, was so worldly. Figures of people, portraits. No, I didn't want it. I learned it well. The good people, but I put it down. Went to Bible school. From there, I became a missionary to Russia. Sweden, Hungary, Turkey, Baku, Muslim world. All because one young girl gave him what? Flag. Let me ask you a question. How many here uh, have come to Christ because someone invited you, told you about Jesus? Raise your hand. How many here uh, have come to Christ? If someone told you about Jesus, raise your hand. Go back. We're high, we're high up. Good. That's why I've been in Right Peter's Church. Amen. Right Peter's Church. You never know what the next person is going to be. God has potential with you. Amazing potential. I say, Pastor, maybe God has potential, but you don't know my life. You don't know my life. I messed up. I had a bad beginning. That's why the second point is also for you. God wants to use you. God sees your failures, mishaps, what happened in your life. Not as strategies, but as part of his plan. Amen? About three, four years ago, and you never know who I'm talking about. Never know. And I went and told my wife about this counseling them. Someone called me up. Pastor, I need counseling. Time with you. And now for coffee. And this person told me this story for two hours. We sat and never heard a story more tragic. That holy father, the functional mother, went to one of her boyfriends. He was molested, went, had a different lifestyle. Oh, we wept together. I never heard a story so tragic. After two hours were over, we wept together, tears in my eyes. Hardly said anything. Offered some advice, counsel. I said, this person, come, only come to church. Only come to church. If you can take some Bible classes. Years later, this person's life is transformed. He now is one of the most amazing servants of God. I look at this person's life, it's so gentle, so wise, so humble, so loving. That's a story of what happens when Jesus steps in. Amen. 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 
I look around this room, we have so many stories of redemption. God did. And the good thing is this, God, God says that people had tragedies, mess ups, failures, that we use you even more sometimes than others. Because you know what grace really means. Amen. <coughs> Ruth lost her husband, father-in-law, brother-in-law, early age. But God has for Ruth the glorious one unfolding. Amen. From the beginning of the end. Imagine this man, someone had been born. Imagine how Jesus saw this woman more differently from other people. If a, if a Jew saw the woman, he would survive. Number one, she's a Samaritan. Number two, she's a woman. Jews been talking about. Number three, she's all messed up. She's divorced, not once, not twice, we see five times divorced. And the person she's living with won't give her right, won't get married to her. Messed up. I think of this woman, I think of someone, modern day, goes to a barroom. She got a short skirt up to here. Low brows, cigarette smoking, goes to barroom, happy hour, you know, happy eyes. <laughs> She's there, husky voice, cigarette smoking, but confused in the world. Wow. But Jesus doesn't see that way. Jesus sees her and loves her. Oh my. Jesus loves her. Oh. I don't know about you, but I think twice uh, asking this person to leave their lazy Bible study. But Jesus doesn't give, give her a class. Jesus loves her. Go evangelize the whole town. Amen. Amen. Imagine that. She goes out, she says, three of all she said, all she says is this one word, come and see this man, come and see this man who told me everything about my life. That's all she said, come and see this man who told me everything about my life. What she also said, that answer was this, and love me anyway. As the 42 verse 3 says, a bruised reed, he will not break, a smoky flack, he will not quench. What's it mean? Have you ever seen a bruised reed, something broken? Jesus said, I want to break it further. Have you ever seen a smoking wreck with the fire going out? She said, I want to put it out. Whatever is there, I'll pan it so we can buy the bigger flame for me. How do I do it? Amen. So we also learn to see people. Oh, as well as these people. We see people as God sees them. John Newton, both oh, amazing grace, both of him amazing grace. He was a slave trader, drunkard, alcoholic. After he got saved, he wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, we sing today, 20 years later, churches. On the stone story of this, John Newton, infidel, found, was transformed by God's 
Amazing guys. We also see people in St. Bain. We had that in the night. We night. We see what grace can do to people. We don't see people in their tragedies. We don't see people in their failures. Because we also have plenty of them. We see people hidden in Christ. We see people with Christ in them, hope of glory. Amen. Number three, we see people, we see our natural abilities as God sees them transformed by the supernatural touch of God. We find this too. We find you. Moses fled from Egypt. I tried to be delivered up my own strength, kill the man, fled. Now he's in, in the wilderness. There he is married, has a beautiful wife, two lovely kids, good in-laws, all's going well. Moses thinks I should retire. God said no. Moses, I have a bigger plan for you. I have a mighty plan. Use you as a deliverer for my people. So one day God meets Moses. Where? Come on. Back in bush. God says to Moses, morning, he says, listen, Moses, what do you have in your hand? What does Moses have? What does Moses have? Award. We can the award. A shepherd's award. That's all he has now. No longer friends. No longer. All he's done for 40 years is be a shepherd. What do you have in your hand? He said, God, I'm happy to be a shepherd. God says, throw the rod down. So the Lord now, how shall I know that you have asked me to do something for you? Put the Lord down, Moses. So Moses cast the Lord down. So now, take it up again. When you put the Lord down, we can what? It's like, it's a catch up on the tail. Why do you do that? We tell you what, listen carefully. God gives you many talents. God gives you many abilities. Some of you are artistic. Pastor Mati's son. Some of you love music. I tell you what God put there. Some of you love finance, business, projects. Some of you like Sports. Some of you are like science, discovery, research, looking at microscopes, and the microscopes of kinds of researching. Same with Brother God did. I'll tell you why, Brother, in a moment. Here's the thing, though. In a natural talent, what you have is like a rod can be used as a gift to God first. God said to Moses, throw it down, give it to God first, then take it up again. Why? When you, when you took it up, it became a supernatural rod. When you, with the rod, Moses took the same rod, with the same rod, he passed the Red Sea. So the same rod, he struck the water. Water came out. From that time onwards, that rod was called the rod of God. Why did it throw it down first? Why did it become a snake? 
I say two reasons. Number one, a snake with an emblem of Egypt. Egypt. So I take the Egypt by itself. Secondly, in every world we have, in all our times, in every world there's a snake. Explain to you. In every world there's a snake. Say again. In every world there's a snake. What do you mean? God gives you chance. God gives you career. God gives you gifts. God gives you play music, sports, business, world. But in every world there's a snake. Means this is a touch of the curse and sand. When man worked, he planted the fields, the garden Eden, after the fall, thorns and thistles came. Everything we do now is touched by the curse. But what we do is this. We cast our robe before God. He said, now take it out. I won't have a, I won't have a touch of the curse of it. I have the supernatural touch God upon it. See, that's what God says. Put the Lord down. Give it to me, and I will resurrect it with my supernatural touch. May I say that? Bless the mighty, may the God of your God love us, love us. It's all little others, but one day. You go to God. God said, listen, Mati, put your ass down. Learn the Bible for some time. And so learn the Bible. God said, so roll and put your ass, put it down. So for 15 years, 10 years, he laid his ass down. And then one day in Turkey, when the art is very exhibition, God said to him, now take the art up again. Use this to support, support yourself for the gospel work. So now he paints again on the side. However, his paintings are different, beautiful paintings, but in the paintings, one art has a message, message of the cross, this cross in the it was the ladder, Jacob ladder. It was uh, seen to do it the big thing after after a church. And people buy it all when they now uh, Jordan's Jordan's king. Muskets, royal family comes by his bending. Well, Axon played basketball, so he wanted to get injured. God said, I had a preacher preaching. He said, Lord, I'll follow you. Whatever I do, will that be as exciting as playing basketball? God said, okay, well, God took the Lord, came back to him, and for his own glory. We see this. We live our lives on earth, but we're also dependent on God fully. I say, God, thank you, you give me chance, but here I am. I cast what I have in my hand to you. It's a snake. But when you give it back to me, it's a supernatural touch of God. God said, listen, catch him by the tail. Why catch him by the tail? Catch a snake by the tail, but a bear's head bite me. God said, no, catch him by the tail. Because when you catch the tail, I catch the head. What it means is this, 
From now on, you chant it lightly. I will direct you broad. I will direct you so it will have a such God upon it. It will transform what you have to something supernatural. Finally, we see time in the light of eternity. How many of us know on this earth we are time bound? Right? I'm speaking, I give myself half an hour. If we can match that five days, because men have angry reports, water reports. Time, but we sometimes forget. Time will one day in the light of the economy with the main. See, the life I live on this earth is like a dot. Say that. Life on this earth is like a blink. Imagine living life on this little planet called living life. It's just like a dot. If I live for 80 years or 90 years, it's like a dot right in eternity. In the light of eternity, my life is just a paper, a dot. I say, after the life is over, we have millions of years to spend with Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth, oh, and so on that. Let so, me ask you something. What would you do on the new earth? What would you do? We will forget. We live in the new heavens and the new what? Earth. We're coming back here. Don't be scared of leaving the earth. We're coming back here. It's a fun home. Amen? What do you think we do on New York? Do you think we eat? Do you think we eat? Do you like food? Come on, do you like food? I think we have plenty of food on the New York. We like horse riding. How many things we horse riding? on the New York. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Some of you read the Bible. Why do you think Jesus come back on my horses? Why do you think the lion will lay down with the lamb? Why? Oh, wonderful hours one day on the New York. Will you love fools? I think so. The thing you say, I thought all we do is worship Jesus in heaven. That's awesome. When I come back, listen carefully. When we come back to earth, okay, we will rule Christ. We'll also be one big redeemed family. I believe, I believe all my heart with cooking, with food, with music. The people who love music today, we will worship God like never before. We are just, some of you who never went to art school, will paint and draw God's creation. Some of you like sports, will play to ask content, but never for our own fame, our own glory, never. All in the light of God's kingdom forever and ever. Some of you love building bridges. And you are the new heaven, you have not read the Bible. Be society. But redeem, redeem society. We enjoy exploration. You travel to new, to new, new plants in the resurrection body. Or with one intent. Now all this will be pleasure to God. You heard me? 
all this we bless God. When God made us, He made us for His pleasure. The problem today and science is about God, arts is about God, music is about God, as brothers. We know it's in, in heaven, we know prayer, no need for prayer. We know missions, no missions in heaven. Why? Because every heart knows them. We have missions today on earth because there is no true worship. We have no true worship exists. There's no need for missions. On this earth today, every heart with Christ is a missionary. Every heart without Christ is a mission field. We have mission today because not all people know right? know Jesus. So why am I saying that? Because heaven is going to be all the beauty man ever desired on the earth to do exploration, discovery, everything you had desired was put there in seed form. But now we do it with a lean body, a lean mind, all God's glory, take walks with loved ones in heaven. You know that? I'm saying that. And the reason I'm saying that, if you know that's coming, that's why I said this to you. Spend all the time on this earth now, finding people who are lost, to bring them to Jesus. I will only, of all of eternity, in become my sinners, of all eternity to enjoy God, only a few short years to bring the lost. And don't be so bothered by your afflictions. They're so light. They're so momentary. They're so passing. Paul said, live your life in the light of eternity. Live your life. Don't be, as she always says to you, don't be so secure. Don't be so safe. Time. And optionally to God. Take Bible school, have services, mission depths, live your life in the light of eternity. All the time in the world, enjoy heaven one day. And now is the time to serve the Lord. So, thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.